they'd already come in. So. All right. Gonna like give us a cue. Sorry? Who's gonna give? Yes. Can I put this up here? Yeah. Is that in the way? Welcome, everyone. Welcome to Hope When It Hurts. My name is Kristen Weatherall, and this is my dear, dear friend, Sarah Walton, co-author Sarah Walton. Um, this workshop is based on the book that we've written by the same name, Hope When It Hurts. And we're really glad and grateful that each of you are here today. Thank you for choosing this workshop. And we're serious when we say that we've prayed for you. We've prayed for every individual person who is in this room. We've prayed up sound a little bit. Can we turn up the sound just a little bit? Just getting this. Um, we are praying that God would speak to you through his word today. That if you're the one suffering and hurting, um, that his word would, would nourish your soul and give you strength. Um, that if you're the one walking by people who are suffering, that you would be equipped and helped to point them to the God of all hope. So let me pray for us, and then we'll jump right in. Let's pray to our God. Heavenly Father, we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that your surpassing power is true and real and enduring, to show that you are the one who upholds and strengthens us in weakness and suffering. 
Lord, we are afflicted in every way, but we are not crushed. Perplexed, but not driven to despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Struck down, but not destroyed. And this is because we have the life of Jesus in us. Thank you, God, for raising us to new life with Christ. May he be glorified today. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, my story begins junior year of college when the healthy and pain-free life I had known started to fall apart. Over a period of about six years, I went from running and doing theater, the performing arts, and long and energetic days to weakness, inhibited movement, and chronic fatigue that would put me in bed by 8 p.m. I moved to New York City to pursue the dream of performing arts, and soon I moved back home again, exhausted and in pain. I knew that something wasn't right, but no doctor could give me an answer. Every new doctor's visit left me with question marks of defeat, as I would hear the same answer every time. You're fine. You're young. Go home. But the problems got worse as the years passed. After a long day of typing at work, my hands and my arms would ring with discomfort to the point that I I couldn't perform simple tasks like opening jars or doing laundry. My knees and my feet would rage with a similar pain. And the fatigue, oh, that was the worst. It felt like waves of heaviness. It felt like crawling through a dense fog to relate to anyone or to stay cognizant in conversation. I felt like my health was completely slipping away. Well, after six long years, my husband Brad and I were led to a Lyme disease specialist because my symptoms matched those of Lyme. And the day the nurse called with confirmation was really bittersweet. It was good to have an answer after so many years of people saying, there's nothing wrong with you. So good to have an answer. And so scary to not see the road up ahead. What would this look like? Well, by God's grace, and after two years of treatment, we have every reason to believe that the Lyme is gone. And I like to joke that I stay up later than Brad some nights, so (laughs) working on that. Um, But even still, as we say to people today, the war is won, but the city is ravaged. My body has been left weak and has years of rebuilding to do. Some days are long and hard and strewn with discomfort. So my struggle with pain looks different now. But it's a fight. Every day, discouragement stemming from dashed dreams, the things that I always thought that I would do, the frailty of a broken body, and the fight to persevere in hope. Yes, these years have been dark and difficult, but this place of pain is where Christ has met me. And I'm learning how to trust him when I don't understand his ways and to rely on his strength when I'm weak. I'm learning that hope is found in a person, and he is sufficient for me. Well, my story is one, um, as I tried to put it together, um, it's one with a lot of twists and turns, and it's very hard to give a complete picture of. So I'm going to try to take 15 years into five minutes. Um, Without going into detail, during my four years of high school, I experienced bullying along with a form of abuse from peers. At the same time, circumstances that were out of my control brought some devastating redirection in my life. The most difficult was the end of my athletic dreams, which had to somewhat become my identity. It all sent me into a downward spiral, leading to an eating disorder, a broken relationship with my parents for a season, and depression that resulted in me being admitted to the hospital. It was there, though, that I gave up my attempt of trying to live for both Christ and the world, and I decided that I wanted to follow Christ with everything I had. Well, life seemed to become smoother for a little bit. Um, I married my husband at 20 and was a mother by 23, but that was a decade or so ago, and the last 10 years have been greatly marked by loss. From a young age, our oldest began to display behavior that was defiant, violent, destructive, and has caused 
literally a decade of confusion and chaos in our home. Countless doctors and tests, evaluations, everything seemed to leave doctors just simply shaking their heads, saying we know something's wrong, but we can't really figure out what, and we don't really know what to tell you to do. All we were left with in the end was an increased financial burden and growing fears and a lot of confusion. Along with that, my own health continued to grow worse, and with each of the four children I bore, I increasingly found myself unable to function through the day. I had chronic pain that would come and go, um, but was daily, along with an ankle injury that left me unable to do a lot of what I love anymore. As my son's disorder continued to intensify, confusion and hurt really began to grow in my other children, and our marriage ultimately began to suffer under the weight of it all. When we were at our lowest point, convinced that we couldn't endure anything else, my husband lost half of his income, and we were forced to sell our dream home and downsize to a rental home as medical expenses continued to pile up. Our family was literally in crisis. We were broken. We were wondering where God was. What was he doing? I found myself battling despair, hopelessness, really deep questions of faith that I'd really never had to face before. In 2015, we were referred to a group of doctors. Um, Kristen actually referred me to her doctors, um, even though I was convinced I didn't have Lyme's disease. And sure enough, that is what I found out as well. It wasn't long before this testing um, till it led, it revealed that the increasing illness in each one of our kids was also the result of Lyme disease being passed on from me. <laughs> Lyme disease was no longer just my battle, it was now a family battle. So while we have clarity on one of the enemies in our home, um, now we're fighting a new battle of time-consuming, costly treatments with continued confusion and really no guaranteed certainty of complete healing. And on the day that we received the final draft of the book, um, we learned that my husband's company was letting go of the majority of his employees, including himself. Suddenly, we were facing the overwhelming burden of not only a fi family with Lyme's disease, but no income at all. And yet, on that day, six months ago, I really was wrestling. I was wrestling with anger, shock, confusion, and hurt. I was struggling to understand why the Lord's answer to all of our prayers for his help was just more pain. I had to sit down and I actually had to proofread our book which I felt a little angry about. <laughs> but as I read it, I was literally brought to tears. The Lord met me with the very truths he'd been giving Kristen and I over the last year and a half. Suddenly, despite my brokenness and pain that I was experiencing, I really saw the Lord's undeserved goodness shining through my brokenness. I saw truths that he had been teaching me in my darkest days, and was reminding me of them once again as if I hadn't even been part of the writing process. I saw a growing eternal hope despite a continual death to my earthly hopes. I saw the pain of loss, but an even greater gain in knowing Christ more. He is not wasting my pain. He is taking me, my life, a broken jar of clay to display the treasure of the gospel and his strength in my weakness. Every day is still a day of uncertainty. Um, as I endure the ups and downs of my son's challenges, my own chronic pain and fatigue, all four children's Lyme disease, and continual financial pressures. It is really a moment-by-moment -moment choice to press on through the trenches and trust his loving purposes and his grace for each and every day. So how about you? I don't know any of you personally, but I'm going to assume that each one of you is here today because you, either you or someone that you love is suffering. Or you may want to know how to better walk along others who are suffering. Although Kristen and I certainly do not have all the answers, um, our prayer is that no matter what brought you here today, that you will be able to walk away with a renewed hope in your own trials and also a greater understanding of how to walk alongside and minister to those who are hurting. Although there are countless struggles that arise um, in times of suffering, we would like to focus on six common struggles that we can face when we're hurting and how the gospel speaks into each one of them. Many of these we address in the book as well, plus a lot more. Um, one note before we begin, though. Uh, some of you in this room might be in ministry. Uh, you might be in pastoral or lay, uh, lay leadership position over a larger ministry. 
Whether you're a pastor, um, a ministry director, or a lay leader, it's really unrealistic to be able to see and personally walk alongside everybody who is suffering in your ministry. It's an impossible burden that none of us are asked to carry. Um, However, my hope today is that what we share will increase your awareness of the struggles that many of those around you are suffering through. Uh, May you be able to take away something from today that will help you better better to um, reach, encourage the fellow sufferers around you through sermons, through ministry events, small group settings, ministry teams, and simply prayer for those who are hurting in your sphere of influence, which, which will be different for each of you. But first and foremost, our hope is that we will encourage you also to see your suffering in light of the gospel today. The first struggle that I would like to um, talk on is the struggle in loneliness. The road of suffering is certainly marked by hope, but we should not underestimate that it is a very lonely road, too. It was for Christ, so of course it's going to be for us at times as well. I remember when my oldest started struggling, um, and they, it started to become life-altering challenges. It was no longer just a battle. It was changing and affecting every area of our life. I was leaving social events, stores, even church a lot of times, feeling increasingly lonely. I just felt like I was on a scary journey that nobody could relate to. As the struggle continued to intensify, I found myself pulling away from those I cared about, staying home, internalizing the struggle. In the confusion, fear, and uncertain future, I really felt utterly alone. Of course, there were those who tried to offer encouragement, um, ask questions, give their suggestions and their opinions, Um, But it really always felt short of any real comfort. Nobody could fully enter into the pain that I was experiencing and the loneliness that I felt in my own home. But over these lonely years, I have surprisingly begun to feel a sense of thankfulness for the lonely road I've been given to travel. Because walking it has brought me a greater understanding of what it means to be a follower of Jesus Christ and to know him not only as my savior, but as my comfort, my sustainer, my hope, my joy, and my strength. But this doesn't often happen automatically. Walking this hard path has really taught me that there are particular lies about loneliness that the devil likes to whisper in our ear, and we need to learn to recognize them and confront them with gospel truth. Also, by being aware of the loneliness um, that those who are hurting around you might be feeling, we can be more equipped to understand, extend grace, and gently lift their eyes to the truth as well. The first lie I'd like to talk about is loneliness means I'm alone. But the truth of the gospel says loneliness strips away the external comfort found in those around me, driving me to find comfort in Christ alone. There are times when Christ allows us to feel alone. But it's with the purpose of driving us deeper into his word and to prayer in search of the hope-filled and life-giving relationship with him. We can't find true and lasting comfort in anybody else. And when he is all we have left to turn to, we discover that he alone can fill us fill us in the ways that only he could. The second lie is that I am the only one who has suffered like this, and no one will ever be able to understand my pain. I have thought that a lot. The truth of the gospel, though, says Christ will not ask me to suffer anything that he has not already suffered himself. One reason I think why temptation arises in this area um, is because really we often don't know many people in our our, um, circles of friends or family or even acquaintances that have been given the specific burden or trial to carry. Even if we have met someone who has endured the same type of trial as us, different temperaments, personalities, previous experiences mean that our reactions are often still not the same. So it becomes really easy to live resentfully because nobody seems to really understand. And yet there is one who is familiar with pain. He has walked a harder path, who knows us better than we know ourselves, and who promises to never leave us. Isaiah 53.3 says, He was despised and rejected by mankind, a man of suffering and familiar with pain. As one from whom men hid their faces, he was despised, and we esteemed him not. Jesus Christ is the only one who can fully and completely enter into our pain. He alone knows our hearts, our temperaments, our insecurities, fears, 
emotions, and our desires. Jesus knows the pain of loneliness, and he did it all for you and I. As Pastor Colin Smith recently said, If I am troubled, Christ has been there and will walk with me. If I come to a place of dreading the future, Christ has been there and he will walk with me. If I feel the weight of responsibility that feels unbearable, Christ has been there and he will walk with me. If I feel as though I'm walking in darkness, Christ has walked through a darker place than anyone ever has or ever will, and he will walk with me through it. Friends, we may experience loneliness on a lot of levels, but because he went before us, we will never have to experience the crushing loneliness of separation from God as he did. Our loving Father sent his Son down the loneliest road ever known to man so that we would never have to walk any road apart from him. The last lie is that I will always feel alone. But the truth of the gospel says that the loneliness of this life will quickly fade as we unite and rejoice for eternity with our brothers and sisters in Christ in the presence of God. If we follow after Jesus, one day we will no longer have to walk this lonely road. We will be with our Savior face to face in perfect fellowship and unity with every other believer, past, present, and future. I find it hard to even fathom. But it gives me so much hope. Although this road following Christ can feel so lonely at times, I know it's not going to be forever. In fact, in just these last two weeks, um, I've experienced an indescribable brokenness over my son and our family. And the anguish of facing this debilitating illness that I don't know if I will ever be free from. But in God's grace, he is taking my heartache and my brokenness and my loneliness and he is continually lifting my eyes to the hope that this isn't the end. My story isn't finished being written, and although it feels lonely and hopeless at times, it is part of a greater story, God's great story of redemption. And one day when Christ calls his people home, we will be gathered with a great multitude of saints, and we were pla- we we're going to all praise his name together for who he is and all that he has done in every one of our lives. Unity, empathy, acceptance, and joy will replace the isolation, pain, and loneliness of this world. But right now, there are still some incredibly long, lonely roads that some of us are asked to walk. Perhaps you're walking down one today or you know somebody who is. We need to gently encourage one another with these truths when we're tempted to believe the lies of loneliness. Although we may feel alone and sometimes are alone in terms of those around us, because of the gospel, Christ can use loneliness and suffering to draw us into a deeper oneness with him, enabling us to experience hope and joy even on the road of suffering. The second struggle that I'd like to talk about um, that can arise in suffering is in regards to relationships. What What tends to happen in our relationships when we go through hard times For me, after nearly a decade of trials, there have definitely been some relationships that have dissipated. However, it's also brought about a deeper relationship with some of those who have been willing to long suffer with me. Through these hard years, I have learned so many deep lessons about walking alongside of those who are hurting. The Lord's taught me this in two ways. First, by teaching me where my true comfort lies. Pain tends to send us in one of three ways. We withdraw and we wallow in it, which leads us to self-pity and hopelessness. We look to others to ease it, which can make us needy and easily hurt by those who we don't think see our pain. Or by God's grace, we fall on our knees in desperate need of Christ's comfort, which ultimately meets our deepest needs, grows our love for Christ, and lifts our eyes off of ourselves. The truth is the body of Christ is not a replacement for Christ. We will never truly appreciate the comfort of our brothers and sisters until we are first filled with the life-giving comfort of Christ himself through the word and prayer. But as we learn to depend on our Savior for strength, wisdom, and our needs, we often then grow to realize that one of the ways he meets us is through the community of believers. Which leads me to the second lesson that the Lord has taught me. We comfort others out of the comfort that we have received from him. A familiar verse, 2 Corinthians 1, 3 through 4, says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort, who comforts us in all of our affliction, 
so that we may be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. So how does this look practically? Since we often won't be able to relate to another person's specific trials, and it's impossible to fully enter into their pain even if we can, how do we comfort them with the comfort of Christ rather than our opinions, our experiences, or false promises even? We need to first realize that comforting another person in their pain is not simply commiserating with them, and it may not always mean agreeing with them. It's speaking the truths of the gospel that we ourselves have found of greater value than any earthly comfort. We need to point to God's promises while being very real about the present. Instead of telling them it's going to be all right and life's going to get easier, which we cannot guarantee, we can grieve with them and comfort them with the truth that God is near, he sees their pain, and he will be faithful to his promises. Although we may not be able to make sense necessarily of what others are going through, Christ promises that as they choose to trust him, even if their faith is hanging on by a thread and their emotions are fogging the lens of truth, he will faithfully use those trials to accomplish his good and loving purposes in their lives and the lives of those around them. So we may not be able to offer temporary solutions or offer answers, which we shouldn't try to anyway. We can bring the comfort of Christ and eternal value of suffering with him. Here are a couple suggestions to consider, uh, more of which can be found, I think, in chapter 15 of the book. We need to be slow to judge whether others are suffering well and quick to grieve and mourn alongside of them. We need to be slow to speak the truths that we think they need to hear and quick to discern and pray about encouraging them with scripture at an appropriate time and God's promises in a gentle and gracious way. We need to be slow to impatience and quick to learn how to be long-suffering with each other. We need to be slow to run away from the the discomfort of entering another's pain and quick to allow God to use their suffering to grow our own faith. We need to be slow to speak our opinions and our solutions and quick to listen and hear their heart. And lastly, we need to be slow to ask how we can help without really any intention of following through and quick to intentionally and practically help in any and whatever ways that we are are able to. Comfort is not always about being there for everyone and someone in meeting every single need that they have. It's about reminding them that Christ is always there for them and will be all that they need. So let's not be afraid to enter into each other's pain and speak gospel comfort to one another. God's purpose in your trials may very well be to qualify you to walk and cling to walk alongside another one to help them cling to Christ in their trials. As Richard Sibbs wrote in the Bruised Read, Christ chose those to preach mercy who had felt most mercy, as Peter and Paul, that they might be examples of what they taught. Thirdly, The struggle that we can face is emotions that seem faithless. Suffering has a way of rocking the foundation we stand on, our faith. Though at one time we may have felt sure of God's goodness and his faithfulness, suddenly we can find ourselves wrestling with questions and emotions that we aren't really sure what to do with. During this uh, long season of my son's illness ravaging our home, my own chronic pain, the anguish of watching all four of my children suffer, and the loss of our financial comfort, I came to a point where the burdens were, they were so exhausting, they began to wear on my heart, my face, my words. The pain had broken through my facade of strength, and every word I spoke came up, it just came from a place of weariness, of brokenness and confusion. I could no longer manage anything beyond simply clinging to the little faith that I had. I was forced to grapple with emotions that felt really faithless and a lot of deep questions of faith that I've never had to ask. The blessing, however, of reaching this place of being unable to bottle it up anymore is that I was brought to a place of pouring it out. All of my frustrations, my confusion, anger, questions, doubts, and fears to the Lord. I could no longer come to him With these neat and tidy prayers and a heart of genuine praise and thankfulness, I was a mess. I was struggling to make sense of my faith and how my feelings aligned with that. And I was exactly where the Lord wanted me to be, pouring all of myself into his gracious, loving, merciful hands. 
He didn't necessarily make sense of my circumstances, as he often doesn't, but he taught me to trust his goodness and sovereignty over what I can't understand. Friends, we need to learn that it's okay to wrestle through these emotions, through these doubts and questions, when grief sends its crushing blow and we can't make sense of our circumstances. Similarly, similarly, we need to allow others, especially those who we know are really grounded in their faith, the time to process emotions um, in the immediate aftermath of grief and tragedy, rather than immediately correcting them on how their emotions aren't in line with the truth. We see this in Job 6.26 when he replied to his friend's theological accusations. Do you think that you can reprove words when the speech of a despairing man is wind? I love how John Piper explained it. He wrote, in grief and pain and despair, people often say things they otherwise would not say. They say, where is God? Or there's no use to go on. Or nothing makes any sense. Or there's no hope for me. Or if God were good, this couldn't have happened. What do we do with these words? Job says that we do not need to reprove them. These words are wind, or literally, for the wind. They will be quickly blown away. There will come a turn in circumstances, and the despairing person will waken from the dark night and regret hasty words. So let's, so let, let's learn to discern whether the words spoken against us, or against God, or against the truth, are merely for the wind, spoken not from the soul, but from the sore. If they are for the wind, let us wait in silence and not reprove. Restoring the soul, not reproving the sore, is the aim of our love. There are times, yes, when the loving thing would be to point a brother or sister who is weak in faith to the truth, even if they don't want to hear it. However, we need to be very discerning and prayerful and gracious when ministering to others through grief and deep pain. Giving the spirit time to work in their hearts. For often it's through the wrestling of these faithless emotions that the Lord exposes our unbelief, he lifts our eyes to him, and he drives our faith roots more deeply into his truth and his promises. We need to trust that God can handle our mess. He can handle our hard questions, even our faithless ones. It's not wrong to feel this way, but it is wrong to wallow there. Christ is not someone to whom we come and we, we simply vent our emotions, and then we walk away just as lost. But rather, he wants us to come to him in honesty and walk away with him in greater freedom. Similarly, this is how we can help encourage a brother or sister who's wrestling with faithless emotions as well. We need to listen, really, really good listening. Be willing to grieve with them. It's uncomfortable, but we need to learn to grieve with others. Encourage them to bring their emotions and questions to Christ and then gently help lift their eyes to the truth again and the hope that they have in the gospel in those depths and in our honesty something really amazing can happen as we begin to let these muddy waters of our hearts that don't look very pretty run more freely we often begin to see the untruths that we've been believing as well as many of the truths of the gospel that we've never really fully grasped or understood the more we bring our mess our honest questions and our emotions to Christ, the more he reveals to us not only the flaws of our hearts, but the true beauty of his. May we be able to say, as Job said, I had heard of you by the hearing of the ear, but now my eye sees you. Therefore, I despise myself and I repent in dust and ashes. We do not need to settle for or strive for some facade of Christian goodness bottling up these feelings we think good Christians shouldn't feel and trying to present this neat and tidy um, front to God as if he doesn't already know what's going on. As we learn that we are free to be real with Jesus, we're able to learn to be real with people around us too. The world does not need to see more people who have it all together. It needs to see real people with real struggles, real emotions, and a real hope. But being real with people starts by being real with our Savior. Well, while writing our book, Sarah and I felt sensitive to how we would communicate its overarching message. The issue of identity was at stake. If we weren't careful, our message might read, because suffering is who you are, you need hope, rather than what we wanted to communicate, 
Suffering is not who you are. And because you are in Christ, you have a sure hope when suffering comes. Pain and trials cause us to wonder how we're to handle our situation and what this says to the world about our value and purpose. So this is the struggle with our identity. Suffering can turn us inward and make pain our primary focus rather than it propelling us outward to the unchanging truths of who Christ is and who we are in him. Your suffering friend, family member, brother or sister in Christ, maybe it's you, needs to be reminded that suffering is not their identity. It's not who they are. The status of our suffering does not affect the strength of our Savior. Rather, the strength of our Savior tells us who we are in the midst of our suffering. So here are a few common identity statements that suffering people tend to believe. I am the intensity of my pain. I am being punished by God. I am never going to be happy again. So if the identity statement is, I am the intensity of my pain, your identity in Christ says, I am a creature experiencing the effects of sin. And Christ came and died and resurrected to defeat this. This tells me why my pain exists and what God is doing about it. It tells me that pain will not have the final word, but Jesus has, and he will. So I'm free from fixating on my pain and being enslaved to its ups and downs. My Savior is greater than my pain, and someday he will rescue me from it. What about the belief I'm being punished by God? Our identity in Christ says, I am God's adopted child. There is no more punishment for me because all of it was poured out upon Jesus. My father disciplines me for my good, that I would share in his holiness, but not because of wrath. Christ bore the wrath reserved for me, and now all I know is grace. So when pain and suffering come, I can trust that it's his grace that all of it has passed through my Father's hands and will be used for my good and his glory. And finally, the statement, I'm never going to be happy again. Your identity in Christ says, I am a new creation and a saint. Everything that is Christ is mine. Every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, every help and comfort of the Spirit, every promise he's made, all are unshakable and unfading. Because I'm new in him and his stores never run dry, he will give me what I need to walk through this pain with joy and peace, even in much grief and sorrow. And someday, in eternity, every tear will be wiped away and everything will be restored. Brothers and sisters, suffering is real and it's hard and it changes us indeed but it cannot steal our identity, and it cannot shift our foundation. These are the truths we must cling to and preach to ourselves every day when we struggle with the question of who we are. They're truths we can bring to suffering people in right timing to encourage them. So that's our struggle with identity. And now we'll look at the struggle with ministry. Suffering can be distracting. And as we usually understand, it can make us feel useless. Has the potential to make us bitter, to harden our hearts, and to paralyze us. It keeps us from seeing the opportunities that God is putting right in front of us to love others, to share the gospel, and to serve his church. Sufferers are often tempted to set aside ministry opportunities because, frankly, we're wiped out. It's exhausting to be in pain. It's exhausting to be mentally drained, to be emotionally spent. It seems to require all of our attention, and it can consume us. So we feel we have nothing left to give. But the verse that we read earlier in 2 Corinthians 4-7, Paul writes that we are jars of clay. But we have this treasure in jars of clay, to show that the surpassing power belongs to God and not to us. So jars of clay, 
are earthen vessels that would crack over time and would eventually be disposable. And Paul is comparing us to these jars. He's saying we are weak, we are breakable, we are disposable. But our cracks, our weaknesses, our pain exist for a purpose. They shine forth the great light of the gospel, which is the treasure that we carry. It's the light of this wonderful truth that we display through our unique sufferings. And this is ministry. I'd like to read a passage for us from Colossians 4, where Paul is writing a letter to the church while he's chained in prison. And in thinking about this ministry, um, the passage was striking to me, so I'll read it for us really quickly. Continue steadfastly in prayer, being watchful in it with thanksgiving. At the same time, pray also for us that God may open to us a door for the word to declare the mystery of Christ on account of which I'm in prison, that I may make it clear which is how I ought to speak. Walk in wisdom toward outsiders, making the best use of the time. Let your speech always be gracious, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how you ought to answer each person. So notice where Paul is as he's writing this letter. He's in prison. He's suffering, yet it seems he's, he's empowered by his situation, not defeated by it. His physical chains have encouraged him to keep proclaiming the truth that has spiritually unchained him and set him free. So he asks for prayer from the church that his team would continue to pour forth the light of the gospel in the cracks of their imprisonment. Paul is not bitter. He is not a hardened or paralyzed man. He's not distracted. No, this servant of Christ knew that his cracks and his persecutions were opportunities for the gospel, not obstacles to be ignored or leveraged as an excuse to do nothing. In Christ's light, your suffering is a ministry. It's not a millstone. It's a gift. It's not a glitch in the plan. And suffering believers need to see their circumstances as giving them a unique opportunity for gospel ministry. This could be ministry in your home. Your spouse, your children are watching how you live this gospel that you proclaim as you suffer. It might be the ministry of comfort to other believers as they see you trusting Christ in your suffering and finding him sufficient. That's amazing. And it could be the ministry of presence, walking alongside a suffering friend who's going through something that you've been through. And it might also be to unbelievers, as Paul writes here. The scripture says, walk in wisdom toward outsiders, making the best use of the time. Unbelievers are watching how we suffer. They're asking the basic questions of hope. How is this person able to endure? How well can their belief system bear the pressure of this? The way you suffer speaks volumes. And you may have no better platform from which to proclaim God's grace in the gospel than that of your own suffering. By his grace, your suffering is a ministry, the light of the gospel pouring through the cracks of your affliction and into the heads and hearts of those around you. So press on in ministry. And finally, our last struggle is the theological struggle of suffering. Causing us to ask the hard questions, suffering makes us wonder, where's God when I need him the most? Is God really good? Can I trust him? Why do I have to suffer like this? Biblical discernment is vital for every Christian to pursue because suffering is a guarantee. And we know we need to know what God's word says so that we can stand firmly when it comes. And there are many theological distortions that we could cover, but I'd like to focus on the prosperity gospel. There's no prosperity gospel conference with this kind of a workshop. <laughs> it doesn't fit in their theology. This view of Jesus says that he promises his followers a happy and healthy life with no troubles. And I'd argue 
that this false gospel is one most of us believe without even realizing it. When we get angry, when we grow bitter, when we expect a certain outcome only to feel slighted when it doesn't happen, this is the root of pride bearing the fruit of entitlement, which says, I deserve an easy and comfortable and predictable life. And now most of us in this room would never actually say that, right? We know and we love the true gospel. There is no other gospel. But at the core, it's what we think and feel. And some version of the prosperity gospel is at the root. Of course we lament. We grieve and we feel disappointment over our suffering. These are normal responses. And we see them everywhere, especially in the Psalms. But we know the truth. Jesus suffered. And those who believe in him will suffer too. Jesus says in Mark 8, 34, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Self-denial, shouldering our cross, following Jesus wherever he may lead, and that includes suffering and hardship. We must be on guard against the belief that Jesus is here to cozy up our lives and make things easier for us. We follow a suffering Savior in a sin-infused world. Health, wealth, and prosperity in this life are not the message of the true gospel. And there's a warning attached to this for us. If we're deceived into believing this theology, even by degree, we won't follow Jesus for long. We'll become disappointed, bitter, and our hearts will become hard. This gospel devastates people's souls because they're either, they'll either reject this God who doesn't keep his promises or they'll just flit through life, storing up treasures on earth and neglecting the only future that matters. But our Jesus, he didn't avoid pain and poverty. He entered into it. He suffered and he died so that we would know hope and joy and peace in the midst of suffering and pain and poverty right now. He walks with us in grief and loss and fear and physical pain and darkness and betrayal because he knew it all himself. And he resurrected to give us treasures in heaven and eternity in his presence with an inheritance that far surpasses any earthly savings account or retirement plan. I don't know about you, but I want that Jesus. I want to know him as I suffer. And I want his gospel. And so I'll fight for it every day by soaking in his word and asking him to give me all that I need to follow him in suffering, to love him increasingly more by the day. Aren't you comforted, friends, that Jesus knows your pain? He defeated suffering by dealing with our greatest need, healing us and delivering us from sin's grip. He's the suffering Savior who went through death, bearing God's wrath for your sin so you would never know it. And he's the risen Lord who transforms death into a gateway to eternal life, defeating suffering by triumphing over it through resurrection. This is your hope. This is your Lord. And he's with you even when it hurts. Sarah, will you pray? Lord Jesus, even as we speak, we speak out of weakness. And yet, once again, you are faithful to shine your gospel through weakness. You know the hearts of every single person in this room, and you know their pain, you know their circumstances. You know what's weighing heavy on their hearts today. Lord, I pray that you would take everyone out of this room with a renewed hope that no matter what they are going to face when they leave this conference, that you are with them in it, that you will equip them, and that it is for your purposes. Not a moment of it will be wasted. Thank you, Lord, that you have given us this gospel so that no matter what happens in our lives, it is never pointless. You have given us life, not only on this earth in you, but eternal. And I just thank you 
Father, that you promise to never leave us or forsake us. In your name we pray, amen. Amen. If for some reason, well, for very good reason, there is not any left, because this is, this is going very quickly in the book, um, we are directing people to, to go to Amazon. They have a one-day delivery on the book. So if you're not able to grab a copy in the bookstore uh, before this evening, you can get it on Amazon as well. 